in First uh, John. We'll probably end that out tonight. It's been a wonderful uh, uh, journey through First John, and, and we have only looked at it from one dimension. Um, we'd be here a lot longer if we did just a whole chapter, verse by verse, but we haven't done that. Um, but we have looked at many of the things that uh, we should know. We looked at how um, that there, there is, a, there is a, a clear distinction between believers and unbelievers that John is trying to get across. What's interesting, if, if for those who remember, when we went through the book of John, I introduced that and I said, we're going to see in this book a lot of people who believe but who aren't saved. And uh, sometimes that throws us in the interpretation if we don't realize that. Many of Jesus' followers believed him. Uh, it says even some of the Jews believed on him, and yet they did not believe in him. And it really, it, it's really amazing. And so we see the same thing, uh, that same thought uh, that runs through the book of 1 John. I want to continue from this morning. We left off in verse uh, 17, uh, actually 16. And I sure hope that we, we got that. If we didn't, then get the, get the CD, go back over it, read back over it, because I think it's important. Um, where he's talking about interceding for people in the church who are, are sinning, uh, who, who have sinned. Um, Versus people in the church who are abiding in sin. And if they're abiding in sin, they don't belong in here anyhow. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Um, he kind of uh, closes that section out a little bit uh, in verse 14 then. When he says, now look, all unrighteousness is sin. I'm in First John chapter 5, verse 17. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin that's not unto death. And so the sin unto death is not a matter of, of really um, whether it's a little or a big sin. That is not what is being promoted here. We know that in Catholicism we have mortal and venal sins. So there's some differences between these, these kinds of sins. Some you can get forgiven here, some you can go to purgatory or wherever it is and get those for forgiven. Some you can pay your way in, and then there's some that you can't, the unpardonable sin, of course, that uh, is, is promoted. That's not what John is promoting here. He is uh, not trying to make that distinction. The distinction is between the true believer and his heart and the unbeliever or the false believer and his heart and how you can distinguish the two, how you can distinguish the two. And so... Uh, uh, some kind of, uh, when you look at this from a little big sin uh, 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 way, some kind of sip on sin. They sip on their sin, amen, until that sin consumes them. But these are the ones who kind of look at sin as a little sin. And they, they just kind of sit back and they want to sip on it and sip on it, um, gradually one indulges themselves in these little sins because they keep sipping until the cup is empty. <laughs> Amen? And so they're drinking out of the cup of sin and they don't realize till perhaps it's too late that they are sinning unto death, that there's more to this than sipping on it, that they are actually uh, moving in a direction they shouldn't be, but they don't come to realize that. Uh, he who persists in a little sin really is admitting that they are or they may be wrong in what they're doing. But then they add, it's not that bad. Uh, we always want to ask people, what is that bad? Well, they will go to the extremes. Always go to the very, very extreme of some conduct and behavior that anybody would think, even a a, um, an unbeliever would think would be repulsive. Amen? Uh, but they, they categorize it as not that bad. And, and then they'll, they may add to that, you know, come on, we got to have a little spice in life. That's a way of saying it's boring being a Christian. 
And uh, so, sometimes <laughs> I think we, we, we think that way. It's boring being a Christian. We can't do this, we can't do that, we can't do this. That's the mind of legalism. That's not a heart of love. It, it's kind of like uh, being married and say, why do I have to just stay with you? <laughs> I mean, right? And then, it <laughs> and, and then expect the partner to say, hey, okay, that's fine. See, love keeps us from doing that. The law doesn't keep us from doing that. Amen? It doesn't stop us at all. It, 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 because there used to be a law out there that they put you in jail for it. There used to be a law against sodomy. They put you in jail for it. But no more. Uh, they don't do that anymore. And so uh, we, we, we are satisfied uh, only when, when we are loving God in relationship to his love towards us. Then we're not looking for something else. We're, we're, we, we have what life is all about and the enjoyments that we have. And there are some enjoyments we can enjoy. We, we never cross that line. We have no desire to cross that line. And we are cognizant that there is a line there because after all, we're still in this world. And this world has some, some, some outstanding enticements and temptations to grab the eye. You can't drive down the street without some kind of advertisement, some kind of something telling us to, to do something, to eat something, to go somewhere that we're not any good and they can make us good. Uh, all kinds of enticements to draw us away from walking in Christ and, and enjoying our life. Jesus says, I want your joy to be full. And so to say I've got to spice up my life a little bit really is a term that is, is saying I really don't love God enough. He is not satisfying enough. And um, if you remember a while back, I, I mentioned, I said, you know, one of the toughest prayers, at least one I've had to pray in the past, uh, in my in, in my past, is Lord, I, I just don't love you. Th that's my problem. Help me to love you the way I ought to. We think love is some kind of automatic thing. We think love. We 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 can't, we um, uh, define it pretty much in human terms. Where um, you know, if, if we go back to high school or we go back to junior high you know you see that little person and all of a sudden you're in love with them just that quick don't know anything about them but boy everything's getting flushed and oh my goodness and you know <laughs> it's kind of gotten crazy and by the summer you can't even remember the person's name what happened that wasn't love we can't measure our love for God in terms of feelings we have to we have to do that in terms of a decision we make to respond to the love that he, he, whereby he loved us. Amen? Uh, the feelings will catch up. But in case they don't, <laughs> uh, it is supposed to be a joy to love the Lord. And if that joy is not there, we ought to go to the Lord and say, expose me for what, what, what I am and, and what's going on inside of me. Amen? While others like to sip their sin... I mean, where some like to sip their sin, others like to gulp it down at all at once. <laughs> uh, forgive the term, and some of you will identify with it right away. But, uh, you know, we used to call that chug-a-lug. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you, you kind of made a game out of, out of that. See who could gulp it down the fastest. I will not define what it is. <laughs> But um, it wasn't milk. <laughs> and uh, but while some sip, others, they just gulp it down all at once. They plunge somewhat headlong um, into sin without a second thought about what they're doing. And so they give themselves wholly to it. Now, whether we sip it or we gulp it. Sin will consume, and whoever abides in sin, whether they abide by sipping sin or gulping sin, they all drink from the same cup, and that leads to death. That's a path to death. 
the sipper is a little more deceived than the gulper. The gulper knows they're going to get drunk, you know. The sipper thinks if I sit here and sip and sip, I'll be okay till they're laid out on the floor. All unrighteousness then is sin. Some are careless with their profession of faith. And that leads them into sin. They're involved in amusements. They're involved in uh, different things in life that appear innocent, but are drawing them, uh, gradually drawing them away from, from, from Christ. They simply cannot resist that momentary uh, pleasure that sin offers. And sin offers a momentary pleasure. The pleasure in it, actually sin is not doing that. It's abusing something God has given us. And then because it, it's abused through sin, the pleasure is short-lived. When we, when we take that same thing and, 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 and you, uh, um, approach it from God's perspective, amen, the pleasure or the joy lasts. The joy lasts. It lasts. Um, you know, uh, the, the big thing today and being encouraged is one night stands. And, you know, that, that doesn't last. There's an old, <laughs> there's an old jazz tune called, um, uh, that has to do with, uh, they call it a Sunday kind of love. And if you think about some of the titles to these songs, it really amazes you how miserable the world is. But it's called a Sunday kind of love. And the lyrics go something, I want a Sunday kind of love, one that lasts past Saturday night. <laughs> you see, th that's hurting. That's, a, that's, that's hurting. That's a person who's wanting more of a commitment and they're not getting it. And they keep trying, but they keep, they're not getting it. It doesn't last. But when we do it right in marriage, it lasts. It lasts past a moment in time. Amen? And so, while some are categorizing sin as little or, 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 or big, others uh, don't recognize uh, their, carelessness, their carelessness, and so they fall into sin. Another category would be those who have become dull of hearing. Now, when we become dull of hearing, that's the beginning of the slip. That's the beginning of the slip. When, when I'm, I'm no longer excited about the Word of God, there's something going on I'd better check out. I'd better not let that thing continue to go. I'd better find out why is, is this dull of hearing. And it's not, uh, when, when the Scripture says that they're dull of hearing, they're not talking about what's being presented they're talking about, they're assuming that the right thing is being presented, but I'm just, not, I'm just not sensitive to it anymore. It just doesn't matter to me anymore. And I don't realize that it's not the preacher that I'm becoming insensitive to. I'm becoming insensitive to the voice of God. That's who I'm becoming insensitive to. Because that's the voice that gets past what the preacher could ever ever past where the preach could ever go that's deep inside of us that's where god is speaking to us that's that voice in us sometimes if we're listening here or 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 we're reading uh, or we might hear something in in a good tv message or radio message something inside of us just kind of wow man and that's god's voice that's him that's real that's not accidental amen and so uh he wants to make sure that as he talks about the sin unto death and he relates that to the brother who does not sin unto death and to the false brother who sins unto death. He's saying that all sin is unrighteous. So no one thinks that because I'm a Christian, then I, I, I'm, not, I'm not subject to sin in its full weight. Not in terms of, uh, yes, Christ died for our sin, but God hates it. it. And he hates it more when it's coming out of a Christian. 
He hates it more than when it's coming out of a Christian. Amen? If that's possible, <laughs> even. So, sin known by any other name is still sin. Because all unrighteousness is sin. Sin will always be sin. Sin will never be anything but sin. How many times do I have to say it to say sin is sin? Period. After going through uh, 16, 17, and 18, John moves on to three absolute certainties to summarize now uh, much of the thoughts that he has been presenting uh, throughout the book, not just in chapter 5. And he does that by presenting these three certainties of our standing, three certainties of our standing. Verse 18 says, we know that whosoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been, has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. So now he's bringing everything to light. And he's saying, there's a difference. When you got saved, there's a difference. Because if there is no difference, then how do we know? You see? But he's saying this emphatically and with absolute certainty. We know. This is something we know. To be born of God means literally, literally, I have been birthed by God. I did not birth myself. I am born again because God did a work to bring forth a life in me that was not there before and impossible for me to attain that life apart from getting it from God. And so that says I had absolutely nothing to do with it. I could have had nothing to do with it because it came out from God himself. So regeneration then does what? It gives us a new nature. Not figuratively, not figuratively, but in reality. We get a new nature. As a result of this supernatural birth, then, John continues here. He says that he that is born of God does not sin. So he's starting to wrap things up. He's starting to kind of uh, uh, summarize. He says, we know this. Now watch. He says, something, the new birth, has occurred in the past. Right? But that new birth... Is, on, is an ongoing experience up until the present. Up until the presence. Present, that is. And what he is saying is, you just weren't born and got some new doctrine. You traded in the Old Testament and you just got a new doctrine. That doctrine is called the New Testament. But there's nothing more to it than that. You were given a life that began at a certain point, a point in which God birthed you, gave you this new life. It started at a certain point. If that life is there, it is continuous and, and, and ongoing right up until this present time. What an argument. What an argument. And he's saying, if that, in, 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 in opposition to that, then he's saying, hey, look, if that life is not there, then something didn't happen down here. <coughs> because it's not a work of man that he's talking about. It is a work of God. And God said that when he saved us, he broke the power of sin in us. And he gave us a new life. New life being what? Different from the old life. And if that new life is there... It is ongoing, and it continues and continues in the present. For that reason, you see, this is not a human thing. This is a God thing. For that reason, the fact of our new birth in Christ, it is simply not possible for one who is born of God 
to abide in sin. He says, you know that. You know that. The false brethren does not know that. And he's not or she's not going to hear that through external means. Because it is God who has done that work. Not man walking the aisle and saying some words. Uh, some years ago, wow, uh, long, long time ago. I can't even remember when, but probably uh, the late 80s, early 90s or so. We, was, we, we had a, a group of young men and they, 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 they came and they were talking about this revival that went on across town. And... Uh, and, and one of the guys were talking about, he brought his friends there and man, how they all had went up and they, boy, they made a profession of faith. And uh, he said, man, that, that felt good. And then, man, we just, we just went out, man, and, and we got us some pot, man, and we just had a, we had a party. Now, now friends, there's something wrong with that. There's something fundamental wrong with that. You see, we may say, well, you know, God has to clean them up. A new birth begins at a point in time and is ongoing. The fundamental of the born again, the mature Christian, the, the foundational principle for that is sin is broken in my life. This is not a matter of spiritual maturity. It's a matter of fact that I'm born again that this thing can't go on. If it is going on, it shows that nothing happened here. I might have said something, but that does, I'm not saved by what I say. I'm saved by what God does and whether I believe that he did what he said he was going to do. But the actual birth is not a function of anything that I do. Anything that I do or could do to gain the life that God has given me in Christ. Not possible. He says that he does not sin by the fact of his birth. He secondly says... But he who is born of God keeps himself. We are kept not by our own self, but as 1 Peter 1, 5 so, so, says so well, we're kept by the power of God. That's how we're kept, by the power of God. It is, it is, it is a frightening thing when you sit down and really think about, wow, man, I, I haven't contributed anything to this. And but for, for the grace of God, look what he's done. That ought to humble us. That ought to stir up in us that love that, 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 uh, uh, that Christ is bestowing on us, that he, he, would, he would give us this life. Jesus prayed, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Jesus prayed a prayer in John 17, 11. He says, keep through thine own name those whom thou has given me. Keep through thy own name them that have, you have given me. And then in verse 17 of John 17, 15 of John 17, he says, keep them from evil. Wow. Keep them means that the very seed would remain in them. And when we get saved, you might have heard me say before, God assumes responsibility for my soul. That doesn't absorb me of my responsibility for obedience. Not at all. But if I'm dependent on me to keep me, I can't be kept outside of God keeping me. Amen? Yet we are... <laughs> Uh, first Timothy, excuse me, first Timothy 5.22 says now, here's what your responsibility, God is keeping you, but now you need to keep yourself pure. 
He's keeping us, right? He saved us. Our responsibility then is to keep ourselves pure. We're in a relationship with Christ. We cannot have many lovers. Keep yourself pure. What keeps us pure? Love. What keeps us pure? Obedience. What keeps us pure? The abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. James 1, 27. Keeps himself unspotted from the world. Our responsibility. Jude 21. Keeps themselves in love. Boy, without love, we cannot and will not obey God. Over the long haul. We, we won't do it. Long or the short haul for that matter. Amen. First John 3 and 3 even says, Every man that has this hope purifies himself, even as he is pure. Romans 4, 21, And being fully persuaded that what he promised, he's able also to perform. He's going to keep me. He said that whoever believes in me shall not perish. Amen? Is that what he said? But then, then if he said that, then I'm fully persuaded he's able to do that. He's keeping me as I am keeping myself. How? Because I obey. That's how God is keeping me, through his word. Isn't that great? He's just not keeping me no matter what I do. He's not just keeping me well, you're saved, and I know you're sinning and all that, but I made you this promise. No, the promise was based on repentance. And repentance is what leads to faith. And the, and the repentance is a work of God and what? That it is a godly repentance. It is not just human sorrow for what I did, because I wouldn't be sorry. I, I would have no sorrow in what I did, but it, but it were not for God. And so even, even my repentance comes from God in terms of God is working in me to bring me to that place. Isn't that great? That's how we got saved. God brought us to that place. And when we repented, that meant that we, we came in agreement with God of the egregiousness of our own sins, the, the horribleness of my sin. I'm in agreement with him and I'm hating with him. Why? Because he is showing me. The price that Jesus paid for my sin. He's showing me that. And so I'm, these are things that I know. He says, you got to know this stuff. You got you to just hang on to that. This is not a spiritual maturity thing. This is what salvation is based on. And we grow from that. And if we don't have, know this foundational uh, truth, well, maybe we better start going back and talking about salvation. Amen? The Holy Spirit is the one that does what? He regulates my thinking. He that, for as many as are led by the Spirit, these are the children of God. How does the Spirit lead us? Through the Word. This renewing of the mind that we've been talking about. And he gives us the mind of Christ to use, not just to possess and carry around, but to use that in the decisions that we make every day, in guiding us in a way that is going to bring glory to God. Help us and show us how and, and what we ought to be doing in our ministries. Love of God keeps us faithful. We've talked about that. Nothing, no matter how enticing, satisfies the true believer like his or her relationship with the Lord. When we didn't understand godly love, and I use these examples because most of us at some point in time have experienced it, you know, as, as young people. We used to call it going steady. <laughs> you know, that, there wasn't no marriage in that, but there was this going steady. And if you were going with somebody, 
you better not be going with somebody else. <laughs> Amen. See, uh, that, that's how it works. Now, if we're going with God, <laughs> we better not be going with somebody else. Well, why didn't we go with somebody else? Because this is the person that, listen, we committed ourselves to them. I know in some cases with me, my mama told me, she said, you better stay away from that, that gal. She ain't no good. I want to tell mama so bad, your son ain't no good either. <laughs> but you know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> But you keep yourself, watch this, not because of anything the other person does, but because what you believe at that time, true or not true, but what you believe at that time is in your heart that you're not going to have anybody else because the one you're with, as, as, as crazy as it may be, man, that satisfies me. I don't, I don't want nobody else course the summer hadn't came yet <laughs> you know and i mean it, it you know how many of those do we go through before we find out you know this ain't really it but when you're lost you don't know when you're lost you don't know amen so i'm not trying to get into a works mentality here and neither is john john is trying to say we keep ourselves not out of some regiment of laws that that we've got to not do this or we got to do this or we don't love God. It is out of a pure heart of love that we do any of it. That's what it is. Then this doesn't become that burden on us. You know, that burden on us. I would venture to say most of us when we got saved, there were some things we were doing. We just stopped doing them because we thought God didn't like them. We didn't know whether he liked them or not. We just thought he didn't like them. And we stopped doing it because, because we loved him. We were responding to that love. Where is that love today? We're guided so much. The more we learn scripture, the more we, we lapse back into a law mentality of do's and don'ts. And we're losing the very thing that Jesus says. You're never going to obey me unless you love me. That's just never going to happen. You can try all you want. Amen? But you're going you're to do just like they did in the Old Testament. Oh, you're going to say all the right things, but you're going to do all the wrong things. But when you're loving me, I guarantee you're going to do more right things than you do wrong things. That's going to happen. Because even when I do the wrong thing, I'm trying to please God, and I've made an error in my thinking and my judgment or whatever. Amen? E even in that, and because of that, I can find forgiveness. Wow, isn't that great? Isn't that great? <sighs> he goes on to say, not only that he who is born of God keeps himself, but then he adds... In verse 18, and that wicked one touches him not. No, the devil did not make me do it, Mr. Flip Wilson. <laughs> the devil did not make me do it. Why? Because I've been born of God. Verse Peter 8 warns us, be sober, vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy. There's not a soul in here that doesn't, doesn't know that. Not a single one of us. How many of us apply it to our lives? How many of us are guarding our heart? How many of us recognize that this, when Satan is roaming around, what's he doing? He's putting enticements in front of our eyes. He's putting things in, in front of our path to, to entice us, to tempt us, to draw us away. How does he do it? He uses wicked men. He uses wicked women. He uses whatever he can to attach himself to the old man and try to bolster the old man. He can't do it. He can never have us again. Can he tempt us? Yes. Can he try to entice us? Yes. Sometimes uh, he gets around. <laughs> Amen. But he can never win the fight. 
Isn't that, isn't that great? To know he can never win the fight, though he might. The, the, so, so we need to know um, where we stand. He's going to stand against us always. Now watch this. The, the sin nature is always standing up against us. That's what Galatians says. The, you know, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These two are contrary. They're never going to reconcile each other. They fight each other because, you know, the Holy Spirit wants to gain ground in us. Amen. And that old sin nature says, oh, I ain't giving that up. But then the Holy Spirit gets in there. Where can he attach himself? He can't attach us to our soul. He can't attach himself to the new, na the new nature. What does he entice? He can only entice the old man because the new man can't be enticed to do wrong. Isn't that great? Why? Because he's satisfied in his relationship with God. You see what I'm saying? Has to move out of the, the, the legalistic mindset of doing and look at, man, do I love the Lord? But here he's saying, because I'm in Christ, that this wicked one, he cannot, he cannot get to us. Jesus once said that the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. Well, if I'm in him, he's got nothing in us. Amen. Satan, for all he did, for all he did from the garden to the cross. Be a good study for us to see how what he did to prevent Jesus from going to that cross. For all that he did, for all the, the thousands, perhaps, perhaps millions of people he used to try to corrupt the seed of God, Balaam, that he tried to destroy the, 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 the people of God, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. For all he did, he couldn't do it. Think about that. That Jesus, that Jesus, that he could not, Satan, could not overpower, is the same one that, in, that dwells in us. He couldn't touch Jesus. Did he touch his body? Oh, yeah, he did. Oh, yeah, he did. But the scripture says, but God ordained it. So in reality, watch this, in reality, he didn't do it. God did it on our behalf. That'd be something if, 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 if the scripture just said, well, God just stood back and let the devil just do what he did to Jesus because, you know, that, that Jesus had to go through. Oh, no, 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 no. God afflicted him, Jesus Christ. God bruised him. Satan was simply the instrument. He thought he was getting over, but he wasn't getting over because for every stripe that Pilate put on Jesus, boy, it meant freedom for us. By his stripes you're healed. That was freedom for us. And Jesus says, I got to get there. I got to get there to close the deal. Mm. He ain't got nothing in Jesus. And he ain't got nothing in us. He ain't got nothing in us. He cannot prevent us from obeying God. He cannot ever latch on to our soul to keep it in any kind of way he can't do it not possible we can't even give him amen when the scripture says that we should don't give place to the devil it simply means keep fighting don't back up don't give him an opportunity to win to win one of these things but he can't he can't have us he can't at any point bring us back into the bondage that we had before Christ came. He couldn't stop Christ from unlocking the gate and telling, come on out of there. Amen? He can't do it. I like that. I like that. By God, we have been placed out of the reach of the devil. Oh, he can touch our flesh. He can mess with us. Oh, yeah. But he can't have us. 
Isn't that something? He can't do it, church. And even if we die, what'd Paul say? To live is gain, to die is gain. I'm going to live to glorify God. I, I'm going to die glorifying God. Jesus in John 17, when he's getting ready to go to the cross, what's he say? Glorify yourself. Go ahead and do it again. What's he talking about? He's talking about going to the cross. The pain and the suffering he's got to go through through you and I. If we are going to withstand, it's going to cost us something. Because it cost him everything. Did you see the difference? It cost him something. <laughs> it cost him everything. Going to cost us something. Amen. Wow. Jesus then came to destroy the works of the devil. When we sin, we sin not because we no longer, watch, abide in the sphere of this world. That's why we sin not. And it's, it's, it's important to explain this. Why? Because I want to I I get the, the thought out of our mind that, that maybe we think and we're talking about we're not capable. Oh, no, no, no. We're, 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 we're capable. But the difference between the believer and the unbeliever is one is under the domain of Satan, the prince of the power of the air that works in the children of disobedience. See, children, people, the, the unbeliever is disobedient for a reason. For a reason. Because they're the children of disobedience. That's who the devil is. Isn't that amazing? And he tells us we're not children of disobedience. When we disobey, we're out of character. We're out of character. Because we're in Christ. And Christ said, Father, you know I've done everything you told me to do. There's not a single thing I left undone. Perfect obedience in Christ. i got to stay in Christ and my obedience uh, scale will rise a little bit more. Amen? And that obedience scale rises to the degree that I am now taking control of this life and turning it over to Jesus, turning it over to God, turning it over to the Spirit. How do I do that? Through obeying the Word of God. Boy, it, the message doesn't change. There's no, other, there's no other way to say it. Amen? I obey. Why? Because I say it, church. I love God. That's, that's, that's where it's at. This is, this is fundamental. This is fundamental. And so, <clears throat> your home, my home, is different. The authority under which we are is different than the authority that the world operates under. Wow. Isn't that something? Uh, so he's not, he can't touch us. And then in verse 19, he goes on to say, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. If we are of God, then we know we are in God. Let that soak in a minute. I believe to some degree it's the devil who gets a saved person and tries to convince them that they're unsaved. And the, 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 the unsaved person can never get to the point where they say, I'm just unsaved because they, they saved. <laughs> Amen? I tell folk, if you question whether you saved or not, perhaps you saved. <laughs> Cause, because you, you, you never questioned whether you were saved when you were lost. You never said, I wonder if I'm lost. And you certainly didn't say, I wonder if I'm saved. And so we, we need to probe that a little bit, bit, bit better. While the world is under the control and the sway of the evil one, he that is born of God abides in a completely different place, the kingdom of our God. Amen? And, and you notice those first two words in 19? We know. We know. We know. And, it's, and, and previously he said that it's our faith that does what? Overcomes the world. 
According to uh, Acts 26, 18, Jesus has delivered us from the power of Satan unto God by the forgiveness of sin. Sin gave Satan a hold on our life. When Jesus broke the works of the devil, he broke it because he broke sin in our life, and that was the only control the devil had over you and I. Because while we were in sin, we were identified directly with him. God overthrew him at the cross. He overthrew him. If Satan was more powerful, Christ couldn't have done it. We'd heard a battle that went on. There was no battle going on. He won. He won before he got to the cross. Amen? He, he won that battle. He's won that battle for us, watch, and he's won that battle in us. He's won it in us. Our thinking, we know, we know, we know. John keeps on and keeps on uh, repeating that. Um, so we, we, we sin not because we're no longer abiding in this sphere of this world. We're no longer under the control of the power, of the prince of the power of the air. 20 tells us then, the third thing is we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his son Jesus Christ this is the true God and eternal life three times he has said what we know in 18 we know in 19 and we know he said these are absolute certainties that, the, that, that give the born-again believer the assurance of their salvation. By what we know, we know what God has said, we believe what God has said, uh, that, that settles it for us. Doesn't matter what, what else the devil has to say. We know that Jesus is God in the flesh. We should know that. Now I want to just tell you something, friends. There's not a human being on this world, in this world. I don't care how many charts they set up. I don't know how many, no matter how many graphs they show. I don't care how many scriptures they throw at us. There's no way to know that Jesus is God in the flesh except God tell you. That's what John is saying. Isn't that something? See, that's what faith is all about. I believe what God has said. Emmanuel, God with us. I'm going to believe what the scripture said about Jesus Christ. He is God in the flesh. Amen. We do not just know these things, but they are revealed to us. He has given us an understanding of things that we would never know, but that he, he revealed it to us. He didn't give us greater intelligence. We still are who we are. That's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about is he has made it clear in our minds who Jesus Christ is. He said, we got to know that. Well, you say, wow, I didn't know that. Well, yes, you did. That's how you got saved. Because God did that work of saying, this is my son. That's how it, that's how it happened. My mind being the exact words I'm putting it, but let me just tell you what, it came right to Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus is, the tr is, is, is true because God opened our understanding to that truth. Therefore, anyone who comes and says there's another way to heaven, they're wrong, not because I go to New Harvest Church, not because of the doctrine that I follow, but because God has revealed to me the, that his son, Jesus Christ, is the God man. That's how I know. That's how I know. You can't prove it any other way. To a Christian, you can show it. You can, you can go through this and say, you see, here's where God said this and here's where God said this. But see, God's already told you that. <laughs> He's already said that to you. Isn't that amazing? If we don't know these things, that's where the devil is able to 
find a place to harass us. To harass us. Amen. You know, before we got saved, we looked everywhere trying to find purpose in life. Uh, we sought just about everything in the world trying to find fulfillment in life. Sometimes we do that now, and, 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 and I don't understand why. Because I'm complete in Christ. I'm complete in Christ. Now, the old sin nature, it recoils at that because it says, well, man, can't I have any fun? See, we just went to the wrong place. We just went to the wrong, that quick. That's how, that's how the sin nature works. That ain't what God's talking about. He says, I don't want you walking around with a pruned face. You can't save nobody that way. I want you to enjoy me. And when you in, are enjoying me, you will enjoy the life I'm giving you. And when you're enjoying that life I'm giving you, you will be rejoicing. And when you rejoice, you're going to draw people to you. Amen. There are no external means then, none, archaeological means, theological, if you will, that can be the definitive proof that Jesus Christ is exactly who he says he is, except God reveal it. Most of us did not know Scripture when we got saved. Now, we sat in church, and we knew of Scripture, and we listened to stuff. But that listening to that stuff did not convince us that Jesus was the Christ. Something began to move in the, the, the very bottom basement of our heart, and it, it began to swell up inside of us. Something was there moving in us. That was God pushing out the doubt, pushing air, clearing out the brush, making truth so clear. And somewhere in there, we said, Abba, Father, somewhere in there, we gave our life to him because of what he did, not because of what was said from a pulpit or from someone else. Oh, God might have used that. I'm not saying he didn't. But the proof came from God. God wanted us to know you didn't just get saved by a series of doctrines. You got saved because those doctrines that you thought you knew, I gave you some understanding that that's my, my word, this is my voice, and that I've come to save you from your sin. Mm. No man can say, for example, 1 Corinthians 12, 3, that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now we can go back and start cleaning up some brush back there. Boy, if we, we, we study that alone, we try to figure out, well, people are saying all the time, you know, I'm a Christian. Well, it, but they, 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 they make one, them one. Nobody in their heart of hearts can say that Jesus is Yahweh, God, but by the Spirit of God. Isn't that great? Luke 10 says, God, Jesus says, I thank God. He's hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and he's revealed them unto babes. Wow. The scripture says the common people understood him. All of those theologians and all of those Pharisees and Sadducees and you remember when they, that the old fellow who was crippled for all them years, he born that way from birth or so. Jesus told him, you know, pick up your bed and get on out of here and walk. And he's walking around and they find him on the Sabbath day carrying his bed. And they said, who healed you? Who did that? Who did that? Amen. Oh, they, 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 they were ready to pounce on this man. Man, they weren't ready to rejoice. Hey, the guy's been, he's been this way all these years. So they, they go and accost his parents. The old boy said, the parents, they scared. They say, hey, look, he's, he's grown. Let him speak for himself. They weren't going to get in the middle of that. <laughs> Amen. And then, and then, you know, they, they run him down. And, and finally, they, they get to him. And they said, well, you know, this man's a sinner. This man is this. He said, well, I, I don't know. But, you know, uh, we know God don't hear sinners. And those theologians, are you here to teach us? <laughs> they, they didn't get it. They didn't get it. 
You don't get it through mere intellect. I don't care where you're at in life. We get this because God revealed it to us. For it is written, says 1 Corinthians 1, 19 through 25, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise and where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. They went about building idols, didn't they? Trying to find God. Towers trying to find God. The world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we pe preach Christ crucified. To the Jew it's a stumbling block. To the Greek foolishness. But to those who are called distinction. Both Jew and Greek. Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. We know because Christ has caused us and made us to know. We would be as dumb as these chairs if Christ hadn't come back, if God hadn't come and made it known that Jesus is the Christ. There would be no way that we could have known. Three certainties. He says, you take these certainties and you, you undergird everything that he has said from chapter 1 all the way through. He says, you take these certainties and you walk out the door with that. You remember these and you'll be able to apply those. Just remember the basics. No spiritual maturity here. This is the foundation, foundational truths of Christianity. And if we don't know these, and the unbeliever don't, though they may be in church, they don't understand this, and therefore they cannot produce the fruit thereof. They, there's no way they can do anything different than they're doing. The person who is a Christian and gets himself or herself into something they had no business getting in for whatever the reason is. You see, you can work with that person because they got a heart and they know. They know. We can grab them. We can pick them up. And we, can, we, can, uh, we can dress their wounds. We can let them know that the love of God is still there. We can restore them back. We can bring them back. But the unbeliever... He says something we hear all day. I don't need no repentance. Don't be judging me. I'm just doing the best I can. Well, the best you can ain't good enough. And it's never been good enough. Jesus did it all. Amen. Men, come forward, please. Father, we are blessed to be here tonight. <sighs> You're always opening and, and revealing and reaching out to us, securing us in Yourself, showing us repeatedly, Lord, Father, God, that what happened on the cross still has power today. You've given us these elements to, remember, to remind us of that, Father. This bread, which causes us to remember that broken body and the cup, the blood that was shed for us. And that a result of that, Lord, Father, that happened 2,000 years ago, the manifestation of that truth abides in us tonight in this place right now. Bless them, Lord, for the purpose you've given it. In Jesus' name, 
Amen and amen.